Please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter seven. Proverbs chapter seven, and we will go there in a moment. A few introductory remarks that I'd like to make before we hit uh, the actual text that we'll be uh, using tonight. On December the 19th, 1998, then President Bill Clinton was impeached on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice. Some of us old enough to remember that. It was a while back, wasn't it? He was accused of lying under oath and trying to cover up his involvement in an illicit affair that he had with a young intern that worked with him at the White House. The President of the United States had a sexual affair with one of his staff. He then lied about it and was nearly removed from office because of it. Now, I remember at the time Mr. Clinton's defenders kept saying that he didn't do anything wrong. It was no big deal. People were getting excited. You know, the, this kind of thing happens all the time, they were saying. It's just you know, prudes. People are being prudish over this thing, and, and, and that it was a personal thing. It was between him and this young woman, her name was Monica Lewinsky, and his wife. You know, they need to keep that in the circle. It was nobody's business, and you know, this, this was the defense line. But we knew, of course, that it was a serious thing, because if there had been no illicit sex, then there would have been no lies, and there would have been no impeachment trial, and all the drama that came with that. The, the country was mesmerized by this, uh, by this event and what took place afterwards. I remember at the time that they often showed President Clinton and his family leaving church on Sunday with the president clutching his Bible. I, see, I still see that image in my mind. You know, they call it a, you know, a, an opportunity uh, to uh, show that he was uh, actually a very righteous person, you know, a, a photo opportunity, that's it, a photo op of him leaving church and you know, trying to rebuild his image. Well, perhaps if Mr. Clinton had opened that Bible that he hung on to, if he had opened it to Proverbs chapter seven and read it, he would have found the wisdom and the warning that might have saved him from the terrible sin and the fall uh, that he was subject to. I mean, let's face it, he was actually a very good politician. He was charismatic and you know, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, not the issue. He, he rose to a great power, the top uh, position in our country, the president of the United States, he, he was president at, at a good time in America. You know, the things were good, economy was good, and, and he lost all of this. And even to this very day, they can't talk about him without also mentioning this terrible thing that he had been involved in. You know, it stuck to him uh, forever. Well, you and I, we're not as influential as presidents, but our souls are just as precious. So let us look at Proverbs 7 and let's read about Solomon's warning against falling to the charms of an immoral woman. And I need to make a little parenthetical statement here just in case. I'm not even suggesting here that only this woman, uh, Monica Lewinsky, she's to blame. She had 100% of the blame. It was her fault. No, no, there was plenty of blame here to, to go around, but I'm looking at this from the perspective of a man uh, not being careful and allowing himself to be drawn into a situation which uh, cost, nearly cost him the presidency, certainly caused his reputation to be tarnished uh, forever. Now this particular proverb, Proverbs 7, has been regarded by some scholars as a warning against idolatry for Israel, uh, but it fits equally well as a warning either against idolatry or a warning against a person uh, to uh, avoid sexual sin. So let's start reading it. Chapter seven or Proverbs seven, verse one. The writer says, my son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live and my teaching as the apple of your eye. 
Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend. So the reader begins, so, uh, the writer rather, Solomon begins by extolling the value of his teaching, the importance of the wisdom that he is trying to impart, especially to a young man. It's very focused, this warning, this instruction to a young man. And the wisdom, he says, that he gives should be like a treasure, like a protector of life. Uh, the favorite thing that you have among many things, something to be me uh, uh, memorized. Uh, they used to have rings with large signets where passages uh, or laws were, were written so that they could remember them and keep them. Um, something that is known and appreciated like a family member or a friend. Wisdom should be like that and understanding should be precious like that to a young man. Goes on in verse five, he says that they may keep you from an adulteress from the foreigner who flatters with her words. So here he describes a concrete benefit deriving from a knowledge and an adherence to this wisdom. They keep you from being seduced into sexual sin. He goes on in verse six, he says, for at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice so after setting up his point, and his point is that wisdom guards against the fall into sexual sin, after he set that up, he gives an example to prove his point. So verses seven to nine, we continue. Um, verse seven, he says, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. So he introduces the male character in this story. A young man, but he says a young man without wisdom or experience. And he says about this young man, he's not trapped unwittingly by temptation. He actually goes and, 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 and looks for it. He's actually persistent. He's there in the early evening and he's there all the way to the middle of the night. You know, in, in modern language, we would say, here's a young guy just looking for trouble. He's just out there looking for trouble. Now in verses 10 to 21, Solomon paints a portrait of this immoral woman and describes how she seduces this naive and foolish young man. What is amazing about this portrait is how accurately it describes the immoral woman of every generation and of every culture. So let's begin reading the immoral woman profile beginning in verse 10. He says, and behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. So he begins with her looks. She dresses provocatively. She's not a prostitute, but she dresses like one to draw sexual attention. He also describes her heart, which cannot be seen. He describes her heart as cunning. She knows exactly what she's doing. She knows exactly what effect that she has on men, and she knows where to find these men. Verse 11 and 12, he says she is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she breaks convention, she breaks rules. Nobody's going to tell her what to do. She's a rebel, she's available. She's always, we say today, she's always cruising, looking. She knows what she wants and is always on the lookout for it. Verse 13. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, so stop right there, what does he say about her? She's aggressive, right? She kisses him and not the other way around. Usually it's the guy you know, trying to get a hold of the girl and maybe get a kiss. No, 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 she kisses him. She gives him a taste of the sensuality that is to come. Here Solomon, quotes the words that she uses to seduce this young man. Words that she utters without shame, 
without embarrassment. And so in verses 14 to 21, she uses three lies to complete her seduction of this young man. So the first lie is, I'm not a bad person. That's the first lie. I'm not a bad person. Verse 14, watch how this goes. She says, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. So the offerings mentioned here are thanksgiving offerings for blessings received. According to Leviticus chapter 7, verse 16, the person offering such sacrifice had to eat the meal by the second day and could also share the meal with a guest. So what she's doing is she's drawing him near while throwing a few you know, crumbs to satisfy any needs that his conscience might have. She may be dressed like a prostitute. She may be sexually aggressive, but she's not a bad person, she's got religion. She's actually a religious person. And of course, if she's not a bad person, then he's not a bad person either. So don't let your conscience make you feel bad about this, the fact that I found you, I was aggressive sexually with you, I'm dressed provocatively in order to draw you in. Don't let that throw you off. I'm really a good person. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a religious person. So that's the first lie. The second lie is this. This is going to be so much fun. We are going to have such a good time. Verses 16 to 18. She says, I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. So what is she saying to him? We're not going to go to some cheap motel. We're not going to go to some dump. This is a nice thing we're going to do. Everything is clean and fresh. Everything smells good. Let's make love, wonderful love. Now there's an interesting warning that the young man doesn't notice because he's so caught up in the seduction. Her bed is perfumed with exactly the same mixtures used to embalm dead bodies. <laughs> He's going to his grave and he doesn't even know it. So she promises to satisfy him. She calls what they will do love. She guarantees that he will enjoy himself all night long. He will enjoy himself. She appeals, of course, not to his mind, not to what is right or good. She makes her appeal to his most basic sense and promises gratification. And she promises gratification now. No waiting here now. You're going to get what you want now. So two lies, right? One, I'm not really a bad person. And that means you're okay too. And lie number two, we're going to have fun. Lie number three, lie number three, Nothing bad will happen. Don't worry, nothing bad will happen. Verse 19, for my husband is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and the full moon uh, he will come home. With her many persuasions she entices him. With her flattering lips she seduces him. Listen, <laughs> never mind what's happened so far. The very fact that she utters the two words, my husband, <laughs> ought to send up flares, right? No. The last barrier is the fear of consequences which she appeases with assurances that nothing bad will happen. She refers to her husband, not as her husband, but the term there is the good man, the good man as if he were not connected to her, as if she had no allegiance to him. The husband is not home and won't be home for a long time, so we won't get caught. Relax, chill out, this is going to be wonderful. So this was not the last lie 
that she told him. But Solomon summarizes the encounter by saying that she flatters him and she draws him into her plan with her smooth words. In other words, she promised him safe sex. Safe sex. So Solomon leaves the readers to imagine the rest of the story. And he writes the final outcome for the young man because of the behavior that he has exhibited with this woman. And he gives three images to explain what is really happening to this fellow. He compares him, he does it as a comparative thing. Number one, he compares him to a sacrificial bull. Verse 22, it says, suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Now, because of their contrary nature, it may require many blows to get a bull to move one foot towards his stall. But then, as what happens very often, suddenly, without warning, he'll just charge forward into his own captivity. That's what these animals are like. Well, the young man has done no speaking so far. Notice he hasn't spoken here. He's remained motionless. But suddenly he makes up his mind, throwing all caution to the wind, and he follows the woman home to his own destruction. First comparison. Second comparison, he compares the young man to a deer who has come within the range of a hunter. Verse 22, B, it says, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver. Uh, uh, through his liver. Let's just stop there. Now this passage can be translated two ways and the way not printed here in this text actually makes more sense. The other way it should read, as a stag goes in a trap until an arrow pierces his liver. That makes more sense. Of course, the trap is the hunter's trap, a way to lure the animal within range of his arrow, because once he's within range of the arrow, too late for that animal, he's as good as dead. So the young man was safe until he came within the influence of the woman. Once he was there, he was trapped and he didn't even know it. He won't even see the thing coming that will destroy him. And then the third analogy, a bird in a trap, verse 23b, he says, as a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. You know, birds constantly looking for food, they flutter quickly from one possible source to the other. One of these is a trap, and the bird quickly seeks it out without realizing that what he thinks will sustain his life will actually take his life away. Well, in the same way, the young man rushes into a situation that he thinks will bring him life and pleasure, but instead, it will only cause him pain and death in the end. So with this verse, he closes out the story of the young man and the immoral woman. In the last verses, he's going to go back to addressing his readers and leave them with a final warning. So here are the warnings. Verse 24 says, Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. So he calls on his readers to pay attention to what he has taught them and the final words of warning that he's about to impart. Verse 25, he says, do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. You know, we have an expression today, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there, he says, stay away from this type of seductive, dishonest, rebellious woman. Don't let anyone like this near you, near your heart. And don't go looking for this type of person, the paths. Don't go looking for this type of situation. Verse 26 and 7, another warning, he says, for many are the victims she has cast down and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Yeah, third warning, you know, she, don't go there, why? She is dangerous. You know, many times young people think they can handle it, oh, I can handle it. But Solomon warns that sexual seduction is very powerful and many who may have thought that they could handle it, can't. Isn't that the trouble a lot of times with younger people, you know, teenagers, people 
younger people, in their minds they know the right thing, especially if they've been brought up in the Lord, they know the right thing in their minds and they may be fully committed to doing the right thing when it comes to sexual purity and you know, maintaining themselves. You know, they, like they know that if they took a test and you had to quiz them on what's the right thing to do and what should you not do, and you know, they could pass that test of the 100%. The problem is that when they get into the situation itself, the body doesn't listen to the head, <laughs> right? Yeah. The girl says, well, I was going into the situation and I knew his parents weren't home and we were going to be alone, but in my mind, I knew the right thing to do. I'm a good girl, you know, I, I, you know, I know what to do. But in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the moment, sometimes the flesh overtakes the mind. You know, the spirit is willing, knows the right thing to do, but sometimes the flesh is so powerful. And when we don't have a lot of experience, we don't understand that about ourselves. You know, men, in this case, it's a warning to men. Men are weak in this area and they should recognize their weakness. And you know what? They're weak for a long time. I remember a young guy telling me, man, I'm so glad I'm married. I'm never going to have to deal with sexual temptation. <laughs> really? <laughs> now his story may be a parable or a real life episode, but his message to his readers is that if you are not careful, this could happen to you. And the consequences are very, very real. The writer in Hebrews 13, 4 says what? Adulterers and fornicators, they'll be condemned. They'll be lost, they go to hell. Well, Solomon certainly drives home his warning against sexual sin. I just want to draw a couple of lessons from this chapter on how sin, any sin, seduces us. First, sin begins by getting our attention. That's why sin is usually sparkly, shiny, because you know? that's how it starts. It gets our attention. We begin by being curious about evil. We just want a glimpse. We just want a feeling. We want an idea of what it's like. And this is usually because sin, as I said, is wrapped up in excitement or mystery or pleasure. That's how addictions usually begin. Somebody says to you, just try it. I remember the first time I tried dope. And somebody said to me, go ahead and try it. How will you know if you don't try it? And I thought, well, yeah, it makes sense. How am I going to know what this is like? You know, what pot or hash or coke? How do I know? About, how will I have that life experience if I don't try it myself? Always the, always the first, always the first uh, argument. And so the warning is, you know, don't be curious about sin. You don't have to know or experience, not even one time. You don't have to know what it's like to be stoned. You don't have to know that. You don't have to have that experience. You don't need that experience. That's a, that's a lie when somebody says that to you. That's a lie. The biggest lie, well, how will you know when you are married? How will you know if this is the right person if you don't you know, have sexual relations before you get married? And then you'll really be sure. The only problem with that argument is that all the statistics, all of them, show, demonstrate that premarital sex does not contribute to a strong marriage. Premarital sex creates problems that have to be worked out in the marriage. I'm not saying that everybody who has premarital sex and gets married to that person is going to fail at marriage. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is premarital sex brings problems into the marriage, not advantages. But we don't, you know, we don't listen to that, do we? And that's certainly not the message that the media gives us. Of course not. Number two, sin, draws us in with lies. It's always a lie. You know, it's not so bad, or you're going to be okay, or of course the real, the real lie, just this one time. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just do it this one, this one time. If you need arguments to convince your conscience, be careful. 
Be careful. If you have to talk to your conscience and talk yourself into something, be very careful. You know, what did Marty say? Would you, is there any other place you'd rather be tonight? Would anybody condemn you because you said, oh, I went to evening services? Would anybody condemn you for that? Well, no. Why? Well, you know that it's inherently a good thing. Hey, I, I didn't just publicly worship God once today. I took advantage of the fact that you know, there's an evening service and I wanted to go again, be with my brethren, worship the Lord a second time in a, in a, in a public way. Would anybody say, oh, that's a bad thing? No, of course not. Things that are good are inherently good. They're obvious. It's the bad things that are covered over and glittered over. And, you know, those are the things that have to be hidden. The best defense against lies is to know the truth, God's word. And certainly don't violate your conscience. If your conscience is saying don't do that and you don't understand why you ought not to do that, that's okay. It's okay to just say, you know what, I don't know why I shouldn't do that, but I'm going to, not, I'm going to hold off on that till I can kind of think this thing through. That's okay. Because the thing about sin, you got to do it right away. <laughs> come on, come on, now's the time, now's the opportunity. This it'll, it, won't, it won't go by again. A little bit like uh, most of the uh, commercials, right, for cars. This is the last day of the big sale. <laughs> the last day, boy, if you don't come down and buy today, I don't know what'll happen, but I mean, this is the last day. It's like, what is it about carpet stores? Have you ever seen a carpet store that is not on sale? So sin you know, is always on sale, it's always a fire sale. You got to do it now, take advantage of it now, that opportunity will pass. And then thirdly, sin always gives you short-term gain for long-term pain. I mean, regardless of the spin that the White House put on the outcome of his impeachment trial, Mr. Clinton will forever be remembered for the affair that he had with Monica Lewinsky and the events that followed it. That dress, you know, the famous blue dress, is now in a museum. <laughs> and we haven't spoken about Miss, uh, Miss Lewinsky. I mean, she was the victim here. She was you know, in her 20s or something. He was the President of the United States. Boy, if that's not abuse, I don't know what is. But anyways, what about her? Yes, what she did was not right and so on and so forth. But look at the price that that poor woman has paid her whole life. She, she's forever linked to this thing. What a, what a tremendously high price to pay for a, what, a few moments of, of, sexual, of sexual pleasure. Terrible. A few moments of forbidden sex in exchange for a political legacy. Not much of a bargain. So let's make sure that the lesson taught by Solomon so long ago is not lost upon us today. We may not have presidential reputations to preserve, but all of us have souls and we will be judged by God irregardless of our positions here on earth. In other words, presidents are going to be judged and you know, elect, uh, electricians are going to be judged and preachers are going to be judged and teachers are going to be, you know, everybody. The Queen of England is going to be judged. Everybody comes before the judgment seat of God. I encourage the young men in our congregation to heed the warning here and be careful not to be seduced into sexual situations. Everybody around you is telling you it's no big deal. Don't worry. You're not a man unless you've had that experience. Do not believe those lies. They're lies. They're lies. And of course I encourage our young women to strive to be modest and sexually pure and not provoke any man to disrespect her. It is disrespectful for a man to look at a woman with lust in his heart. 
He disrespects her as a person when he does that because he objectifies her. She simply becomes an object that will in some way gratify his desires. That's disrespect. And I say to, well, all women, but certainly younger women, understand that, that that's what's happening. Understand that idea. Don't allow that to happen to yourselves. Be respectful of your own selves. Respect yourselves. You have something, very, your, your sexual purity is like gold. It's silver, it's diamonds. It's a precious thing that you have. Don't allow the powers and the lies in the world to seduce you into giving that away. That's the sad part. You only have that one time. And I encourage all of us to be careful of temptation, obviously, to all sin, regardless of age. We're always vulnerable, always vulnerable. So if there are those tonight who need the cleansing blood of Christ to wash away sin, let me tell you a little story as we close out, just to kind of put a point on this, not in my notes here, but I think it's apropos. Many years ago, there was a, a young woman who came to me. Uh, she was getting married. And um, she had great regret because as a younger woman, she had been sexually active with several partners. Uh, and even at some point had had a pregnancy and an abortion. And with time she became a Christian and uh, then met a wonderful uh, Christian man who knew about her past. I mean, she, they were both open with each other and she shared her past and he shared his past with her and they planned to be married. And I was going to do the wedding and she came to me with what seemed like a silly question to a man. She said, can I wear white? Can I wear a white dress on my wedding day? Because I'd given away my virginity years ago and I acted in ways that I, I wouldn't want my daughter to act. I, I even had a child and lost a child. Can I wear white? And it was a perfect opportunity for me to reinforce in her mind and in her heart the power of the gospel and the power of the blood of Christ. And I said, of course you can wear white because the one to whom it matters, God, has told you that when you accepted Christ and confessed His name, and were buried in the waters of baptism, your sins he no longer saw. So when you walk down that aisle on your wedding day and your future husband turns to look at you, he's going to see what God sees, a beautiful bride dressed in white, as pure at that moment as you were when you were a baby, why? Because you acted in a pure way? No. Because through the blood of Christ, your sins, all of them, especially the sexual sins, have all been washed away. And you are pure in His sight, pure in the sight of your husband, and please remember, pure in your own mind and conscience. By all means, wear white and we will celebrate that day. I say that to say, as Paul mentions, you know, sexual sin is terrible because it's sinning against our own body. You know, it's as if we cut ourselves. And in all the counseling that I've done with people about sin, sexual sin is the thing that just stays with them forever. It's painful. So, you know, I'm not talking to you 80 year olds, I'm talking to you 18 year olds. You know. Be smart, be right, be wise, be good, be pure. It's okay to be sexually pure, it's important. And it'll guarantee 
that you will go into marriage one day with a good heart and a clear mind. Of course, like that young woman, if you would like to have a clear conscience again, then God offers it. If you've never been baptized, come, wash away all those sins, all that impurity. And if you're a Christian that has fallen away or fallen in these matters and want to have a clear conscience with God, then come, confess. Let us pray for you, let us encourage you. And of course, if there are matters that are just too personal, they require more a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of our elders or ministers, of course. All of us are always ready to sit and talk and pray and weep with you and encourage you uh, to be right, to be good, to be pure in Christ. So if you have some way that you wish to respond, please do so tonight as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.